The Audio Partners Publishing Corporation is pleased to present The Black Wedding by Isaac Bashevis Singer. Aaron Naftali, rabbi of Tzivkiv, had lost three-fourths of his followers. There was talk in the rabbinical courts that Rabbi Aaron Naftali alone had been responsible for driving away his Hasidim. A rabbinical court must be vigilant. More adherents must be acquired. One has to find devices so that their numbers will not diminish. But Rabbi Aaron Naftali was apathetic. The study house was old and toadstools grew unmolested on the walls. The ritual bath fell to ruin. The beadles were doddering old men practicing miracle-working Kabbalah. It was said that Rabbi Aaron Naftali wanted to imitate the feats of the ancient ones, to tap wine from the wall and create pigeons through combinations of holy names. It was even said that he molded a golem secretly in his attic. Moreover, Rabbi Naftali had no son to succeed him, only one daughter named Hindley. Who would be eager to follow a rabbi under these circumstances? His enemies contended that Rabbi Aaron Naftali was sunk in melancholy, as were his wife and Hindley. The latter, at fifteen, was already reading esoteric books and periodically went into seclusion like the holy men. It was rumored that Hindley wore a fringed garment underneath her dress, like that worn by her saintly grandmother, after whom she had been named. Rabbi Aaron Naftali had strange habits. He shut himself in his chamber for days and would not come out to welcome visitors. When he prayed, he put on two pairs of phylacteries at once. On Friday afternoons, he read the prescribed section of the Torah, not from a book, but from the parchment scroll itself. The rabbi had learned to form letters with the penmanship of the ancient scribes and used this script for writing amulets. A little bag containing one of these amulets hung from the neck of each of his followers. It was known that the rabbi waged constant war with the evil ones. His grandfather, the old rabbi of Tzivkiv, had exorcised the dibuk from a young girl, and the evil spirits had revenged themselves on the grandson. They had not been able to bring harm to the old man, because he had been blessed by the saint of Koshenitz. His son, Rabbi Hirsch, Rabbi Aaron Naftali's father, had died young, so the grandson, Rabbi Aaron Naftali, had to contend with the vengeful devils all his life. He lit a candle. They extinguished it. He placed a volume on the bookshelf. They knocked it off. When he undressed in the ritual bath, they hid his silk coat and his fringed garment. Often sounds of laughter and wailing seemed to come from the rabbi's chimney. There was a rustling behind the stove. Steps were heard on the roof. Doors opened by themselves. The stairs would screech, although nobody had stepped on them. Once, the rabbi laid his pen on the table, and it sailed out through the open window as if carried by an unseen hand. The rabbi's hair had turned white at forty. His back was bent. His hands and feet trembled like those of an ancient man. Hindele often suffered attacks of yawning. Red flushes spread over her face, her throat ached, there was a buzzing in her ears. At such times, incantations had to be made to drive away the evil eye. The rabbi used to say, They will not leave me in peace, not even for a moment. And he stamped his foot and asked the beetle to give him his grandfather's cane. He wrapped it against each corner of the room and cried out, You will not work your evil tricks on me. But the black hosts gained ascendancy just the same. One autumn day, the rabbi became ill with erysipelas, and it was soon apparent that he would not recover from his sickness. A doctor was sent for from a nearby town, but on the way the axle of his coach broke, and he could not complete the journey. A second physician was called for, but the wheel of his carriage came loose and rolled into a ditch, and the horse sprained his leg. The rabbi's wife went to the memorial chapel of her husband's deceased grandfather to pray, but the vindictive demons tore her bonnet from her head. The rabbi lay in bed with a swollen face and a shrunken beard, and for two days he did not speak a word. Quite suddenly, he opened an eye and cried out, They have won. 
Hindele, who would not leave her father's bed, wrung her hands and began to wail in despair. Father, what's to become of me? The rabbi's beard trembled. You must keep silent if you are to be spared. There was a great funeral. Rabbis had come from half of Poland. The women predicted that the rabbi's widow would not last much longer. She was white as a corpse. She hadn't enough strength in her feet to follow the hearse, and two women had to support her. At the burial, she tried to throw herself into the grave, and they could barely restrain her. All through the seven days of mourning, she ate nothing. They tried to force a spoon of chicken broth into her mouth, but she was unable to swallow it. When the thirty days of mourning had passed, the rabbi's wife still had not left her bed. Physicians were brought to her, but to no avail. She herself foresaw the day of her death, and she foretold it to the minute. After her funeral, the rabbi's disciples began to look around for a young man for Hindele. They had tried to find a match for her even before her father's death, but her father had been difficult to please. The son-in-law would eventually have to take the rabbi's place, and who was worthy to sit in the Tzifkev rabbinical chair? Whenever the rabbi finally gave his approval, his wife found fault with the young man. Besides, Hindele was known to be sick, to keep too many fast days, and to fall into a swoon when things did not go her way. Nor was she attractive. She was short, frail, had a large head, a skinny neck, and flat breasts. Her hair was bushy. There was an insane look in her black eyes. However, since Hindele's dowry was a following of thousands of Hasidim, a candidate was found. Reb Simon, son of the Yampol rabbi. His older brother, having died, Reb Simon would become rabbi of Yampol after his father's death. Yampol and Sivkev had much in common. If they were to unite, the glory of former times would return. True, Reb Simon was a divorced man with five children, but as Hindele was an orphan, who would protest? The Tzivkev Hasidim had one stipulation, that after his father's death, Reb Simon should reside in Tzivkev. Both Tzivkev and Yampol were anxious to bring the union about. Immediately after the marriage contract was written, wedding preparations were begun, because the Tzivkev rabbinical chair had to be filled. Hindele had not yet seen her husband-to-be. She was told he was a widower, and nothing was said about the five children. The wedding was a noisy one. Hasidim came from all parts of Poland. The followers of the Yampol court and those of the Tzivkev court began to address one another by the familiar thou. The inns were full. The innkeeper brought straw mattresses down from the attic and put them out in corridors, granaries, and tool sheds to accommodate the large crowd. Those who opposed the match foretold that Yampol were known for their crudeness. When they played, they became boisterous. They drank long drafts of brandy from tin mugs and became drunk. When they danced, the floors heaved under them. When an adversary of Yampol spoke harshly of their rabbi, he was beaten. There was a custom in Yampol that when the wife of a young man gave birth to a girl, the father was placed on the table and lashed thirty-nine times with a strap. Old women came to Hindele to warn her that it would not be easy to be a daughter-in-law in the Yampol court. Her future mother-in-law, an old woman, was known for her wickedness. Rep. Simon and his younger brothers had wild ways. The mother had chosen large women for her sons, and the frail Hindele would not please her. Reb Simon's mother had consented to the match only because of Yampol's ambitions regarding Tzivkev. From the time that the marriage negotiations started until the wedding, Hindele did not stop crying. She cried at the celebration of the writing of the marriage contract. She cried when the tailors fitted her trousseau. She cried when she was led to the ritual bath. There she was ashamed to undress for the immersion before the attendants and the other women, and they had to tear off her stays and her underpants. 
She would not let them remove from her neck the little bag which contained an amber charm and the tooth of a wolf. She was afraid to immerse herself in the water. The two attendants who led her into the bath held her tightly by her wrists, and she trembled like the sacrificial chicken the day before Yom Kippur. When Reb Simon lifted the veil from Hindala's face after the wedding, she saw him for the first time. He was a tall man with a broad fur hat, a pitch-black disheveled beard, wild eyes, a broad nose, thick lips, and a long mustache. He gazed at her like an animal. He breathed noisily and smelled of perspiration. Clusters of hair grew out of his nostrils and ears. His hands, too, had a growth of hair as thick as fur. The moment Hindala saw him, she knew what she had suspected long before, that her bridegroom was a demon, and that the wedding was nothing but black magic, a satanic hoax. She wanted to call out, Hear, O Israel! But she remembered her father's deathbed admonition to keep silent. How strange that the moment Hindele understood that her husband was an evil spirit, she could immediately discern what was true and what was false. Although she saw herself sitting in her mother's living room, she knew she was really in a forest. It appeared to be light, but she knew it was dark. She was surrounded by Hasidim with fur hats and satin gabardines, as well as by women who wore silk bonnets and velvet capes, but she knew it was all imaginary, and that the fancy garments hid heads, grown with elf locks, goose feet, inhuman navels, long snouts. The sashes of the young men were snakes in reality. Their sable hats were actually hedgehogs, their beards clusters of worms. The men spoke Yiddish and sang familiar songs, but the noise they made was really the bellowing of oxen, the hissing of vipers, the howling of wolves. The musicians had tails, and horns grew from their heads. The maids who attended Hindele had canine paws, hooves of calves, snouts of pigs. The wedding jester was all beard and tongue. The so-called relatives on the groom's side were lions, bears, boars. It was raining in the forest, and the wind was blowing. It thundered and flashed lightning. Alas, this was not a human wedding, but a black wedding. Hindle knew from reading the holy books that demons sometimes married human virgins, whom they later carried away behind the black mountains to cohabit with them and sire their children. There was only one thing to do in such a case, not to comply with them, never willingly submit to them, to let them get everything by force, as one kind word spoken to Satan is equivalent to sacrificing to the idols. Hindley remembered the story of Joseph de la Rina and the misfortune that befell him when he felt sorry for the evil one and gave him a pinch of tobacco. Hindley did not want to march to the wedding canopy, and she planted her feet stubbornly on the floor. But the bridesmaids dragged her. They half pulled her, half carried her. Imps in the images of girls held the candles and formed an aisle for her. The canopy was a braid of reptiles. The rabbi who performed the ceremony was on the contract to Samael. Hindley submitted to nothing. She refused to hold out her finger for the ring and had to be forced to do so. She would not drink from the goblet, and they poured some wine into her mouth. Hobgoblins performed all the wedding rites. The evil spirit who appeared in the likeness of Reb Simon was wearing a white robe. He stepped on the bride's foot with his hoof so that he might rule over her. Then he smashed the wine glass. After the ceremony... A witch danced toward the bride, carrying a braided bread. Presently, the bride and groom were served the so-called soup, but Hindele spat everything into her handkerchief. The musicians played Cossack, an angry dance, a scissors dance, and a water dance, but their webbed rooster's feet peeped out from under their robes. The wedding hall was nothing but a forest swamp full of frogs, moon calves, monsters, each with his ticks and grimaces. 
The Hasidim presented the couple with assorted gifts, but these were devices to ensnare Hindley in the net of evil. The wedding jester recited sad poems and funny poems, but his voice was that of a parrot. They called Hindle to dance, the good luck dance. But she did not want to get up, knowing it was actually a bad luck dance. They urged her, pushed her, pinched her. Little imps stuck pins into her thighs. In the middle of the dance, two she-demons grabbed her by the arms and carried her away into a bedroom, which was actually a dark cave full of thistles, scavengers, and rubbish. While these females whispered to her the duties of a bride, they spat in her ear. Then she was thrown upon a heap of mud, which was supposed to be linen. For a long while, Hindela lay in that cave, surrounded by darkness, poison weeds, and lice. So great was her anxiety that she couldn't even pray. Then the devil, to whom she was espoused, entered. He assailed her with cruelty, tore off her clothes, martyred her, abused her, shamed her. She wanted to scream for help, but she restrained herself, knowing that if she uttered a sound, she would be lost forever. All night long, Hindela felt herself lying in blood and pus. The one who had raped her snored, coughed, hissed like an adder. Before dawn... A group of hags ran into the room, pulled the sheet from under her, inspected it, sniffed it, began to dance. That night never ended. True, the sun rose. It was not really the sun, though, but a bloody sphere which somebody hung in the sky. Women came to coax the bride with smooth talk and cunning, but Hindela did not pay any attention to their babble. They spat at her, flattered her, said incantations, but she did not answer them. Later, a doctor was brought to her, but Hindela saw that he was a horned buck. No, the black powers could not rule her, and Hindela kept on spiting them. Whatever they bade her to do, she did the opposite. She threw the soup and march pain into the slop can. She dumped the chickens and squab which they baked for her into the outhouse. She found a page of a psalter in the mossy forest, and she recited psalms, furtively. She also remembered a few passages of the Torah and of the prophets. She acquired more and more courage to pray to God Almighty to save her. She mentioned the names of holy angels, as well as those of her illustrious ancestors, like the Baal Shem, Rabbi Leib Soriz, Rabbi Pinchas Korza, and the like. Strange that although she was only one and the others were multitudes, they could not overcome her. The one who was disguised as her husband tried to bribe her with sweet talk and gifts, but she did not satisfy him. He came to her, but she turned away from him. He kissed her with his wet lips and petted her with clammy fingers, but she did not let him have her. He forced himself on her, but she tore at his beard, pulled at his side locks, scratched his forehead. He ran away from her bloody. It became clear to Hindele that her power was not of this world. Her father was interceding for her. He came to her in his shroud and comforted her. Her mother revealed herself to her and gave her advice. True, the earth was full of evil spirits, but up above, angels were hovering. Sometimes Hindela heard the angel Gabriel fighting and fencing with Satan. Bevies of black dogs and crows came to help him, but the saints drove them away with their palm leaves and hosannas. The barking and the crowing were drowned out by the song which Hindela's grandfather used to sing Saturday evenings and which was called The Sons of the Mansion. But, horror of horrors, Hindela became pregnant. A devil grew inside her. Half frog, half ape, with eyes of a calf and scales of a fish. He ate her flesh, sucked her blood, scratched her with his claws, bit her with his pointed teeth. He was already chattering, calling her mother, cursing with vile language. 
She had to get rid of him, stop his gnawing at her liver. Nor was she able to bear his blasphemy and mockery. Besides, he urinated in her and defiled her with his excrement. Miscarriage was the only way out. But how bring it on? Hindalus struck her stomach with her fists. She jumped. She threw herself down, crawled, all to get rid of that devil's bastard, but to no avail. He grew quickly and showed inhuman strength, pushed and tore at her insides. His skull was of copper, his mouth of iron. He had capricious urges. He told her to eat lime from the wall, the shell of an egg, all kinds of garbage. And if she refused, he squeezed her gallbladder. He stank like a skunk, and Hindele fainted from the stench. In her swoon, a giant appeared to her with one eye in his forehead. He talked to her from a hollow tree, saying, Give yourself up, Hindele, you're one of us. No, never. We will take revenge. He flogged her with a fiery rod and yelled abuses. Her head became as heavy as a millstone from fear. The fingers of her hands became big and hard like rolling pins. Her mouth puckered as from eating unripe fruit. Her ears felt as if they were full of water. Hindele was not free any more. The hosts rolled her in muck, mire, and slime. They immersed her in baths of pitch. They flayed her skin. They pulled the nipples of her breasts with pliers. They tore her ceaselessly. But she remained mute. Since the males could not persuade her, the female devils attacked her. They laughed with abandon. They braided their hair around her, choked her, tickled her, and pinched her. One giggled, another cried, another wiggled like a whore. Hindala's belly was big and hard as a drum, and Belial sat in her womb. He pushed with elbows and pressed with his skull. Hindala lay in labor. One she-devil was a midwife and the other an aide. They had hung all kinds of charms over her canopied bed, and they put a knife and a book of creation under her pillow, the way the evil ones imitate the humans in all manners. Hindele was in her birth throes, but she remembered that she was not allowed to groan. One sigh, and she would be lost. She must restrain herself in the name of her holy forebears. Suddenly, the black one inside her pushed with all his might. A piercing scream tore itself from Hindele's throat, and she was swallowed in darkness. Bells were ringing as on a Gentile holiday. A hellish fire flared up. It was as red as blood, as scarred as leprosy. The earth opened like in the time of Korach, and Hindele's canopied bed began to sink into the abyss. Hindele had lost everything, this world and the world to come. In the distance... She heard the crying of women, the clapping of hands, blessings and good wishes, while she flew straight into the castle of Asmodeus, where Lilith, Nama, Machlat, and Hormiza rule. In Sifkiv and in the neighborhood, the tidings spread that Hindele had given birth to a male child by Rep. Simon of Yampol. The mother had died in childbirth. Production copyright 1986 by the Audio Partners Publishing Corporation. All rights reserved. The Audio Partners Publishing Corporation is also pleased to be the publisher of Great American Short Stories, a collection of short stories by Mark Twain, Stephen Crane, Ambrose Bierce, and Jack London. For a free audio editions catalog offering thousands of audiobooks on cassette and compact disc from all major publishers, call toll-free 1-800-231-4261. Visit our website at www.audioeditions.com.